Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very important and a basic topic, the art of history taking in neurology. The art of history taking in neurology. History taking is very very important to establish a neurological diagnosis. In fact, it is the first encounter between the patient and a doctor. The first encounter is in the form of history taking between the patient and the doctor. History taking is very important, especially in the subspeciality of neurology. In no other specialty can you make a clinical diagnosis with just history taking. With just good history, you can even pinpoint a diagnosis in neurology. There have been many instances. One great clinical neurologist made a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis of parietal lobe abscess. He just noted fever in the patient and he noticed that there was a decrease in the pursuit movements to one side. The moment there is a decrease in pursuit movements to one side, he knew that the parietal lobe was involved because the pursuit movement comes from the ipsilateral parietal lobe to the PPRF and with fever which suggests an infective pathology structure being the parietal lobe, he made a diagnosis of parietal lobe abscess. The clinicians, the other doctors, went on to find out whether his diagnosis was correct and they took CT and MRI and to their surprise and astonishment it was parietal lobe abscess. So such is the importance, such is the greatness of history taking wherein you can even pinpoint diagnosis by careful history taking. You have to listen to the patient he is telling you the diagnosis. You have to spend time in listening to the patient. History taking is the most important aspect of neurological encounter. You have to listen to the patient. He is telling you all the complaints and you can make the diagnosis out of it. According to Sir William Osler, 1849 to 1919, quote, listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis, unquote. Listen to the patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. So you have to attentively listen to the patient to make a diagnosis. The most important aspect of history taking is attentive listening. So you listen and you can make the diagnosis. So here we go. First, you have to record. You have to ask questions, the positive as well as negative. You record the questions. First, it should be an open-minded question and an open-ended question. You allow the patient to tell in his own language, in his own way. And then when you think you need some relevant information, he's talking irrelevantly and you need to focus. Then you start asking leading questions. So the first part is to Ask open-ended questions followed by leading questions. Then record both the positive and negative history. Negative history is also as important as positive history. The positive history, example, if the person comes complains of glove and stocking type of sensory loss. The sensory loss is only in the hands and the legs up to the knees. You have the diagnosis. It is peripheral neuropathy. It's an it's a length dependent neuropathy, it's an axonal neuropathy. And if a person says he's got difficulty in getting up from squatting to standing position, proximal muscles are involved, it is myopathy. So listening to the patient's complaints is very important. Record the positive history. Record also the negative history. For example, if a person says he's not a smoker, then hypoxic encephalopathy due to pulmonary conditions like COPD or CA lung can be reasonably excluded because COPD and CA lung are dependent on smoking. And if a person has got encephalopathy, features of encephalopathy and is, there's no history of alcoholism, you are perhaps ruling out hepatic encephalopathy. 
because alcohol is associated with liver disease and if he is non alcoholic most of the time he is not suffering from a liver disease so positive history is important negative history is also equally important the temporal profile of the illness very very important whether it is acute and abrupt in onset or subacute in onset going over days to weeks or chronic running to months and years acute or abrupt onset just seconds to minutes subacute days to weeks chronic months to years suppose if a person comes with an abrupt onset of focal neurological deficit and he recovers even without treatment abrupt onset of focal neurological deficit and recovers even without treatment the diagnosis is vascular cerebrovascular accident usually tia transient ischemic attack the deficit recovers within 24 hours usually within 1 hour in fact the signature of cerebrovascular disorders is recovery even without treatment they recover likewise demyelinating diseases multiple sclerosis abrupt onset why they have abrupt deficit because the myelinated nerves conduct velocity at a rapid speed because of saltatory conduction and impulse jumping from one node of franvier to other node of franvier like a kangaroo so once the myelin sheath gets affected the conduction gets affected they present with abrupt onset of focal neurological deficit and they recover also even without treatment even without doctor starting steroids or any you know, immunomodulators they can recover they have remissions and relapse remission means they recover third is head injury when they have head injury concussion they have a momentary loss of consciousness and they can recover even without treatment so abrupt onset and recovery think of three disorders vascular demyelinative or trauma abrupt onset but with a very good response to treatment think of metabolic conditions like hypoglycemia hypoglycemia could be because of increased insulin or fasting or taking too much of sulfonylurea they present in a stuporous or unconscious state just by giving dextrose even before we complete giving the full amount of dextrose person sits up recovers and talks to you very satisfying experience so abrupt onset with a good response to treatment is hypoglycemia even migraine they come with severe headache just give sumatriptan triptan they become well abrupt onset with good response to treatment hypoglycemia metabolic conditions and migraine subacute onset going on for few days suppose if a person has got a uh, subacute onset going the deficit going on few days with systemic symptoms like fever headache think of anemic stiffness think of tuberculosis or or other infections like fungal infections headache with fever think of abscess suppose a slow slowly going subacute or days and the person has got headache and vomiting in fact projectile vomiting think of brain tumors especially bleed into the tumor projectile vomiting what is this projectile vomiting is very characteristic of raised intracranial tension especially due to sos space of penetration and tumor generally when we have a when we feel like vomiting we have a preceding nausea we feel like vomiting we feel like vomit and then vomit so vomiting is usually preceded by nausea but projectile vomiting is vomiting without the preceding nausea they suddenly vomit out without the preceding nausea this is projectile vomiting because vestibular nucleus is directly stimulated because of raised intracranial tension due to space occupying lesion like tumor so subacute onset think of abscess or or infective process meningitis subacute meningitis or a bleed into the tumor then chronic process going on for months and years think of degenerative disorders like parkinson's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis motor neuron disease so this is the temporal profile of the illness very very important acute think of cerebrovascular accident it is the signature of the cerebrovascular accident to present abruptly and recovery recovery most of the cerebrovascular accidents recover so recovery 
and abrupt onset is the signature, the characteristic of cerebrovascular disorders. Abrupt onset of open neurological deficit. Think of vascular, think of demyelinated disease like multiple sclerosis or head injury. Abrupt onset with good response to treatment. Think of hypoglycemia or responding to dextrose or migraine responding to triptons. Subacute onset headache, neck stiffness with fever. Think of tuberculosis or fungal infections. Headache and fever. Think of abscess. Headache and projectile vomiting. Think of brain tumor. A slow, gradual, progressive over months and years. Think of degenerative disease like Parkinson's disease or motor neuron disease. Very, very important the temporal profile of illness. Next, we will go to the other categories. We should ask about diet. If the person is a vegetarian or has got gastric surgery or intestinal malabsorption problems, it might be vitamin B12 deficiency. They can present with subacute combined degeneration or peripheral neuropathy. If a person has got not only neurological involvement but other system involvement like pulmonary, renal, he may be having hemoptysis, he may be having hematuria, breathlessness with neurological involvement, always suspect connective tissue disease, ask with, for history of skin lesions, joint pains because connective tissue disease can present with multi-system involvement. Family history, you should always ask family history, some disorders run in families. X-linked disorders, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, they can run in families, so always ask family history. Occupational history, you should ask the person's occupation because there are a lot of neurotoxins which can affect the nervous system. One good example is the dental creams. Persons who work in dental creams, they have the high level of zinc. The high level of zinc causes copper deficiency. Copper deficiency can cause myelopathy, spinal cord disorders. So ask history of exposure to dental creams, occupational history, personal history, ask for history of smoking because smoking can cause COPD or lung cancer, it can present as paraneoplastic neurological disorders. In fact, lung cancer, bronchogenic calcium is one of the common cancers presenting as paraneoplastic neurological disorders. Ask for history of alcoholism, it can cause alcoholic liver disease, hepatic encephalopathy. And in women, and in women, we should always ask history of menstruation, a regular menstruation, because menstruation can be associated with epilepsy, what we call as catamenial epilepsy. Menstruation can be associated with headache, menstrual headache, and menstruation is protective for women in terms of development of coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disorders, the stroke. The stroke and myocardial infarction are less commonly seen in women as compared to men. Because of the hormones, there is an increase in high-density lipoproteins. High-density lipoproteins is protective against the development of atherosclerosis. And hence, when we compare with the, with the counterparts of similar age, the cardiovascular disorders, the coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disorders are less commonly seen in women as compared to men, as compared to their male counterparts of the same age. But once they attain menarche, once, sorry, once they attain menopause, they catch up with their male counterparts. So as long as they are menstruating, the chances of getting cerebrovascular disease or, or the cardiac coronary artery disease is less. Right. Now, now we shall go to the specific complaints. If a person has got severe headache and neck stiffness, Severe headache and neck stiffness. We have to think of two conditions. One meningitis, second is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Why? Though the brain can get affected in, in multiple problems, it generally does not produce headache. You cut brain, there is no pain because there are no pain receptors. It is only the coverings of the brain which will cause headache, the meninges. The meninges and the dural vessels only are responsible for headache. They are pain sensitive structures. And once the dura is involved, inflamed, it can cause pain. That's why we have pain, severe headache and next if in meningitis. The meninges are involved. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, the arachnoid membrane, the subarachnoid space involved. The meninges are involved. It is irritated. It can cause headache. So headache, neck stiffness, always suspect meningitis and subarachnoid hemorrhage. If a person presents with visual loss, if a person presents with visual loss, think of eye problems 
or the optic nerve, the second cranial nerve is responsible for vision or the destination of the optic nerve, that is the occipital lobe. So visual loss could be anywhere in the neuro axis between the eye, optic nerve or the occipital lobe. If a person presents with double vision, as an image appearing double, think of third, fourth and sixth cranial nerve involvement. If a person com complains of double vision on looking at near objects, it is third nerve palsy, medial rectus. The both medial rectus do not come together, convergence deficiency, so they have double vision on looking at near objects. If a person complains of double vision on looking at far off objects, think of sixth nerve palsy, lateral rectus, they don't move away and therefore person has got double vision on looking at far off objects. If a person has got vertical double vision, think of obliques involvement, superior oblique or inferior oblique palsies. If a person complains of sensory loss or pain over only the face, think of trigeminal nerve because the sensations of the face is supplied by the fifth nerve. If a person has got weakness of facial movements, think of seventh nerve, cranial nerve, facial nerve. If a person has got difficulty in hearing or balance, eighth nerve. The eighth nerve is concerned, the vestibular ocular component is concerned with balance. The eighth nerve is connected with the third, fourth, sixth nucleus to coordinate the head and neck movements with the eye movements through a tract known as medial longitudinal fasciculus. Medial longitudinal fasciculus is the tract which connects third, fourth, sixth with eighth nerves. And therefore, we can use eyes in various combination. I can use right lateral rectus sixth nerve, left medial rectus third nerve. I can use left lateral rectus sixth nerve, medial rectus on the right side third nerve. I can use both lateral rectus, both sixth nerves, or both medial rectus, both third nerves. How is it possible? Because all these muscles are, are on all these cranial nerve nuclei, three, four, six are interconnected along with eight through MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus. If a person complains of nasal irrigation, he, 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 whatever he eats, it comes out to the nose. Or he's got difficulty in swallowing. Think of 10th nerve involvement or 12th nerve involvement. If a person comes with a head and neck problem, like a head tilt on one side, think of 4th nerve palsy, superior oblique palsy. Because superior oblique, example, right superior oblique is responsible for intortion. When there's a right superior oblique palsy, he is not able to intort the eye. So in, he intorts the head to compensate for the lack of the eye movement. So if a person walks in with a head tilt known as Belshowski sign, you have the diagnosis. It is a fourth nerve palsy. Or if a person complains of difficulty in turning the head to the opposite side, sternocleidomastoid weakness. Or if he's got pain in the muscles, torticollis or retrocollis or severe spasm of the neck muscles, think of dystonia, cervical dystonia. Yeah. Weakness. Weakness is a very important complaint. It can be anywhere from the corticospinal tract to the muscle. If the corticospinal tract is involved, if the corticospinal tract is involved, there will be hemiplegia or hemiparesis on the opposite side. If the brainstem is involved, there will be ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy and contralateral hemiparesis. When the anterior horn cells are involved, there will be twitching of the muscles. There will be severe wasting. If motor peripheral nerve is involved, there will be distal muscle weakness. If there is a neuromuscular junction weakness, like myasthenia gravis, they have fatigability. Morning they are alright, by the end of the day they become weak. Or when they start talking, initially they talk well, but after a few minutes, you are not able to hear their voice. It is myasthenia gravis. And finally muscles. If muscles are involved, usually the proximal muscles are affected. They will have difficulty in getting up from squatting to the standing position. They have difficulty in walking with the pelvis in, in balance. What we call as waddling gait. Or they have Gower's sign. All these indicate that the muscle is involved. So if there is weakness, we have to suspect lesion anywhere in the neuro axis. Right from the corticospinal tract in the cortex or internal capsule where there will be dense hemiplegia or the brainstem where they have ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia or anterior horn cell where they have where they have wasting and fasciculations or the motor neuropathy where they have distal muscle weakness or neuromuscular junction where they have easy fatigability or muscle myopathy where they have proximal involvement. They may complain with sensory loss, sensory deficits. Again you have to think right from the parietal lobe till the sensory receptors. 
if the parietal lobe is involved, they'll have cortical sensory loss along with the primary sensory loss of pain, touch, temperature, position, joint, vibration sense. They'll have cortical sensory loss if parietal lobe is involved. What are the cortical sensations? Tactile localization, two-point discrimination, graphesthesia, tactile localization, barognosis. All these cortical sensations will get affected, but primary sensations are intact. If that is the case, then it is a parietal lobe lesion. If thalamus gets affected, they'll have sensory loss on the opposite side, hemisthesia. Then in the spinal cord, in the spinal cord, either the posterior column get affected, selectively posterior column can get affected like vitamin B12 deficiency or posterior spinal artery involvement or where the joint position vibration sensor selectively affected and pain temperature are spared or the center of the spinal cord can get affected like syringomyelia where they have dissociated sensory loss. The, the sensations carried by spinothalamic tract, pain and temperature are affected but to a touch position joint vibration sensor are spared and then finally it comes to the nerve, they have glove and stocking type of sensory loss. The sensations over the hand and the leg are lost. In the spinal cord, posterior column can get affected or the spinothalamic tract can get affected. If posterior column gets affected, position joint vibration sense get affected. So position joint vibration sense, what is the history we ask? For balance, there are three primary, primary tracts responsible for balance. One ocular. Second, the vestibular cerebellum. Third, the posterior column. Joint position vibration sense are carried by posterior column. If one tract get, gets affected, the other two can compensate. But if two gets affected, there is a loss and they'll have imbalance. So as long as the, even if the posterior column gets affected, position joint vibration sense is affected, as long as they are seeing well and the vestibular cerebellum is intact, they have no problem. Because only one is affected. But the moment you deliberately, you forcefully affect the second part like asking them to close the eye, close the eyes taking of the vision component now the two part two points of the three tracks are lost and therefore they'll have tendency to fall so this is known as when they when they stand with the feet clo feet closed and eyes with feet closed and eyes closed rhombus sign what is usually asked when they go to the wash basin and they try to splash water on their face at that time they momentarily close the eyes so visual cues are gone. The second part is gone. So they have a tendency to fall. This is a very important history to find out whether the position joint vibration sense carried by position column is affected. The pain and temperature. Obviously, they give history that they're not able to feel any pinch or painful sensations. One classic history they give is that they are able to appreciate the sensation of touch. But the moment unknowingly they keep their hand in some hot burning, st hot burning stuff or, or fire, they are not able to feel the sensation. The pain sensation, it is syringomyelia, pain and temperature are lost. Yeah, then we have to ask the history of cortical involvement. If there is aphasia, loss of speech, it has to be in the cortex. Motor aphasia, they can understand but they cannot speak. Sensory aphasia, they can speak but they don't understand. Vernix area, temporal area, Broca's area, frontal area. So if aphasia is there, it is in the cortical cortex. It could be in the frontal lobe or in the temporal lobe. Seizures. If seizures are there, it is a cortical irritation. So, if the moment a person says seizures, it is a cortical involvement. Gaze palsy. You have a third, fourth, sixth nerves in the brainstem. But these are all controlled by saccadic pathways. The saccadic pathway allows the eyes to move together. Example, frontal eye fields area number 8. The left frontal eye fields area number 8 will try to move the eyes to the right side. So if it gets affected, the eyes cannot move to the right side, they move to the left side. So a symmetrical movement of the eyes or absence of the symmetrical movement of the eyes. Presence of symmetrical movement of the eyes or absence of symmetrical movement of the eyes we call as gaze palsy. It indicates frontal eye fields area number 8 involvement. Cortical, frontal cortex is involved. If a person has got apraxia, that means inability to perform a learned movement. Person can sometimes mimic and perform an actions on, on imitating. But sometimes a person cannot perform a real lifetime object. Sometimes person cannot perform even, can perform a, a real lifetime process only in bits and pieces. So we have ideational apraxia and idiomotor apraxia. The frontal parietal connect, parietal frontal connections are affected or frontal connections are affected. So we should ask activities of daily living. 
If a person is not able to perform a learned motor act, it is apraxia. It is either the parietal frontal connections or frontal connections being impaired, known as idiomotor apraxia or ideation apraxia. Agnosias. The primary sensations are intact, but the cortex which is responsible for processing the sensations are absent. For example, a person's eyes are intact, but he is not able to see. You call that as visual agnosia. That means the occipital lobe is involved. The person is able to hear well. The, the, ear, the auditory apparatus is intact, but still not able to appreciate what he is hearing. That is temporal lobe is affected. What you call as auditory agnosia. Visual agnosia again are two types. Occipital cortex and temporal cortex getting affected is known as what type of visual agnosia. If occipital and parietal connections are, are lost, it is known as where, ty where type of visual loss. In what type of visual loss, he cannot understand what is going on. For example, he can see the face, but he cannot identify whose face is it. What is gone? This is known as prosopagnosia, occipital temporal involvement. If occipital parietal involvement is there, where is the type of the visual agnosia? Where is gone? The spatial orientation is gone. A simultanagnosia, a part of balance syndrome where he cannot integrate the center of the vision with the periphery of the vision. So agnosias are characteristic of, of the lobe. If it is visual agnosia, it is occipital lobe. If it is auditory agnosia, it is temporal lobe. Memory, if the memory is affected, it is again temporal lobe. Hemi neglect. Hemi neglect again indicates it's a non-dominant parietal lobe lesions. If there's a right-sided parietal lobe lesions, you'll have left hemi neglect. But a left parietal lobe lesions usually does not produce right hemi neglect. Because right parietal lobe controls both the right and the left extra personal space, and the left parietal lobe controls the right extra personal space. So the left parietal lobe gets affected, the right extra personal space is gone, but this is compensated by the intact right parietal lobe, which controls both the right and the left. But if right parietal lobe is lost, both right and left is gone, the right extra personal space is compensated by the intact left parietal lobe. There is no compensation on the left extra visual space. So right parietal lobe lesions produce left hemi neglect and left parietal lobe lesions usually will not produce right hemi neglect. You have homonymous hemianopia, you have the visual radiations coming. So the visual radiations are getting affected either at the level of the parietal lobe or temporal lobe, inferior quadrantonopia or superior quadrantonopia, it has to be in the cortex. If the cortical sensory loss is there, it is a parietal lobe lesion. And an emotional ability, again it indicates a temporal lobe lesion. If there are involuntary movements, either it has to be in the basal ganglia or in the cerebellum. So if all these manifestations or the complaints are, are forthcoming from the patient, it has to be in the cortex. So this is the, this is the important points on history taking, the core concept. Listen to the patient. Listen attentively to the patient. In fact, according to Sir William Osler, listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. The temporal profile of the illness is important and get all the relevant complaints and try to correlate it with the parts of the central nervous system involved. And with careful history taking, you can even make that diagnosis clinically with just history. And in no other subspeciality, you can make a diagnosis with history taking. Only in neurology with just history taking, you can make a clinical diagnosis. That is the joy of clinical neurology. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.